Shalom, brothers and sisters. What are the main contradictions between Paul and Jesus? Douglas Del Tondo compiled a list of 24. This is not exhaustive. That's not the end of it, but these are some of the biggest ones. And I did a long-form read-through of this. I think uh, word for word it ended up being around two hours. That video is on my channel. I'll post a link to it, but this is going to be a quick flyby, an overview of these different points, only highlighting a couple of verses in each just to go through some of the main issues as quickly as possible. Jesus says not to eat meat sacrificed to idols, but Paul says it is okay. Three times in the book of Revelation, Jesus condemns eating meat sacrificed to idols in the letters to the churches in Asia. There are no conditions on which a person can eat food sacrificed to idols based upon what Yeshua says. However, Paul says there are circumstances uh, because an idol is nothing. And superficially true, it, an idol is not anything compared to God Almighty. So Paul uses this to justify in three different places that it is okay to eat meat sacrificed to idol as long as you're in the right circumstances such as not leading another brother astray. Jesus says the law continues, but Paul says no. So in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, I did not come to destroy the law of Moses. Till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass away from the law. And heaven and earth have not passed away. However, Paul is has quite a few quotes regarding the law here. Pause the video and take a look at all of them. But he calls the law the Old Covenant from which we get the concept of Old Testament rather than being a continuous law, such as Jesus saying it has not passed away. He has not abolished it. Furthermore, Paul says the law works wrath, ministration of condemnation, cannot justify, cannot give life, etc., etc. So Paul claims that the law is no longer relevant, whereas Yeshua says we are supposed to continue teaching the law. Paul says the Pharisees followed the law rigorously, but Jesus says they were lax about the law. So Paul says, as touching righteousness, found blameless, I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. Looking at the teachings of Yeshua, he pointed out that, yes, you do tithe mint and rue, and you should continue to tithe even in the smallest things like the herbs. However, they're teaching the lesser commands of the law while ignoring the weightier commands of the law, mercy and obedience. So Yeshua's condemnation of the Pharisees was, in fact, that they were picking and choosing what they were obeying and hypocritically claiming to be righteousness while ignoring some of the biggest commands. Jesus says salvation initiates and continues by repentance from sin and by obedience. However, Paul says man's justified by faith apart from observing the law. To the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Does God justify the wicked? You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated by Christ. Take a look at this writing of Paul and compare that to what Yeshua has been teaching. Only the one who repents from sin is justified. And in this same parable of the publican and the Pharisee, it's the Pharisee trusting in his own election, his own ancestry. He's the one who goes home unjustified. However, the repentant one is justified. Yeshua teaches to have eternal life, follow the Ten Commandments, deny yourself and do works worthy of repentance. Paul, however, gives us the Romans' road to salvation. Say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that he is resurrected. And that is what you need to do. There is no obedience to the law also required in Paul's teaching. There are specific actions that we need to do, such as in the case of a rich young ruler. He had to sell what he had and give it to the poor. To another man, such as Zacchaeus, he had to pay back anything that he unjustly took. There was specific acts leading to the repentance, which he absolutely had to do. Also, I'm going to skip over this, but Paul teaches a, a sort of internal, uh, excuse me, e eternal security once in Christ. Uh, there is now no more 
condemnation. However, Yeshua says you have to keep on listening and keep on believing and obeying the words of Yeshua. Jesus tells the apostles to teach his commands given prior to his ascension, but Paul says not to do so. In the Great Commission, the disciples are told you must teach everything that I commanded you. Paul um, in 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, well, we don't know Yeshua anymore because he is no longer with us in the flesh. And essentially, rather than teaching the commands of Jesus, we see almost no quotes from Paul about Jesus. He only quotes Jesus three or four times, and it's to do with the communion primarily which is actually not something Yeshua even commanded. So where are the rest of the commands of Yeshua if he's following truly the Great Commission to teach everything that I've commanded you to others? Paul says elders are entitled to pay for preaching and teaching, but Jesus says no. 1 Corinthians 9.14, In the same way the Lord's commanded those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. By contrast, without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. There should be no charge or burden made on anyone to listen to the preaching of the gospel or healing ministries. Micah is a prophecy which condemns this. 3.11 Her priests teach for a price, and her prophets of it tell fortunes for money. Jesus teaches there's only 12 apostles into eternity, but Paul adds himself to the list as the 13th. So Matthias was voted to replace Judas. And if you look at Revelations, you're going to see the number 12, 12, 12. There's 12 tribes, there's 12 pillars, 12 foundations of the holy city. So where does this number 13 come from? Paul repetitiously claimed he is an apostle. You can find it multiple times in just about every epistle that he wrote. Paul exhorts and commands celibacy, but Jesus clearly says it is a choice not within everyone's power. So Paul says, do not seek marriage if you are single. Now, Yeshua says you can take that option, but it's only for those who are able to receive it. Matthew 19, 12. Jesus says there is only one pastor and teacher, but Paul tells the church he is a teacher, and there are many pastors and teachers. So Yeshua says, Be ye not called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and all ye are brethren. So there is no church hierarchy. Everyone is brothers and only one teacher. However, in Paul, there is a strong church hierarchy, everything from apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. While some, yes, do have gifts of teaching and others have other gifts, uh, there's not necessarily a, a hierarchy where one is supposed to, to assume that title and lord it over others. Paul says God is the God of the dead, but Jesus says God is not the God of the dead. Paul speaks of the Lord of the dead and the living, Romans 14.9, but Jesus says God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Paul says God does not live in temples made of human hands, but Jesus says he does. So we can see what Paul says here in Acts 17.24. However, Matthew 23, 20, he who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells in it. Jesus says the nations of the world are under Satan, but Paul says the rulers are agents of God. In the temptations of Jesus in the desert when he was fasting, one of those temptations was Satan offering him the kingdoms of the world. Would that be a temptation if he didn't have the power to do that? Yeshua says, my kingdom's not of the world. The rulers of the world rise up against the anointed one. 
Compare that, however, to Romans chapter 13, in which Paul says Christians have a duty to obey because those in authority are God's own agents. Jesus teaches the rapture of the evil ones is first, but Paul teaches the opposite. So in the writings of Paul, we have all sorts of Christians who are looking forward to the rapture that's going to get us out of trouble, perhaps before the tribulation, perhaps during the tribulation. Uh, but Yeshua teaches that the chaff is first gathered up and burned, and then the wheat, <clears throat> then the wheat is gathered into the barn. So the first priority in the harvest is to separate and get rid of and burn the chaff. So it, it's not a rapture per se, but it's the destruction of the evil first and the righteous remain on the earth. It's worth considering as well that the meek shall inherit the earth, the righteous shall not be moved, but it is the wicked that are removed. Jesus says a call is revocable, but Paul says it is irrevocable. Many are called, but few are chosen. Repeatedly in the writings of Paul, it talks about those called to be saints, those called to be this, that, and the other. But simply being called is not sufficient. You have to have a life that shows one is chosen through actions. Jesus says some are righteous, but Paul says it is impossible. So in the so-called Old Testament, there are actually plenty of individuals listed as righteous. Also in the Gospels themselves, uh, there are individuals named as being righteous. There is none righteous, no, not one, says Paul. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. But... Matthew thirteen seventeen. Many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things. Who are the righteous people if there is no one righteous? No, not one. That you may that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, in refer, reference to the judgment of Israel. How could there be righteous blood judging them if no one was righteous? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! You build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. Elizabeth Zachariah, called righteous. Simeon, he was a man just and devout. And we have plenty of other names. John the Baptist, a just man and holy. Paul excludes eating with sinners, but Christ's example we are to follow. And the lost sheep parable is contradictory. So Paul writes that anyone who is of bad character, they're a drunkard or... A sinner, fornicator, etc., with such a one, do not eat. So you're supposed to distance yourself from the sinners. Yeshua came to save the weak, and he welcomes sinners and eats with them. Does that mean he was eating, drinking, and being merry and approving of their sin? Of course not. But Yeshua is the one who leaves the 99 to go after the lost sheep. This involves bumping elbows with sinners. One of the criticisms of Jesus, if, if he's the righteous Messiah, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Yeshua says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The righteous don't need to be called because they're already righteous. They're already doing what's right. It's the sinners that need to be called to repentance. He leaves the 99 righteous to go for the sinners. And we ought to do so. However, Paul says, don't eat with sinners. We need to distance ourselves from those trapped in sin. Paul teaches we are eternally secure, but Jesus teaches insecurity. So all throughout the writings of Paul, we are predetermined to be in heaven. Our salvation cannot be lost as long as we have properly confessed him to begin with, supposedly sincerely confessed him. However, every tree that lacks good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Entry into heaven is dependent upon, even if necessary, cutting off our very own body parts if that's what's leading us into sin. 
Whatever is holding us back, we have to cut it off to make sure we enter in, even maimed. And now, Paul's view of justification versus Jesus' view of justification. Paul says God justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness, even in his ungodly state, Romans 4, 5. However, if you look at Yeshua, repentance is the only way to be right with God. Paul teaches an original sin, but Jesus' teachings contradict that. So Paul is saying no one is righteous, no, not one. The common teaching in Christian churches is that everyone has fallen short. However, sin is not something that human nature requires us to continue sinning until the day we die. We can choose to live righteously or not. And that is why there are righteous individuals listed in the Bible. Who should we follow or imitate, Paul or Jesus? Yeshua said that we, his disciples are supposed to make more disciples, essentially imitating the master. However, Paul repeatedly says, be ye followers of me, be followers together of me. Uh, the quote I don't see here, but he says, follow me as I follow Christ. So Paul puts himself as the middleman where a true disciple should just point to the source. So feed the poor, but Paul puts up barriers. So Yeshua commands that we are to take care of the poor and needy. Whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. However, Paul says, if any man does not work, let him not have food. And this is a very popular concept in uh, the history of Western civilization. Many of the colonies in the United States were founded essentially upon this principle. Yeshua doesn't give any specific guidelines on saying who does or doesn't deserve it, but commends those who are taking care of the needy. Faith alone or obedience to Christ. So Paul repeatedly teaches faith alone, righteousness without works. However, Jesus says on, on Judgment Day, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? If he is your Lord, then he has the right to command you to obey him. Paul denies obedience grants any righteousness unto life. However, Jesus says it does. So Galatians 3.21, if there had been a law which could have given life, righteousness should have been by the law. And in fact, it was. There are a number of individuals in the Bible listed as being righteous. And this is prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus that they were called righteous. Jesus says, if you want to enter into the life, obey the commandments. And Deuteronomy 6, 24. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive, as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. Obedience also in Luke 17.10. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which our duty was to do. And in the Ten Commandments, Yahweh extends mercy to those who love me and obey the commandments. By the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified, says Paul. Pause it and take a look at these other verses here. Jesus sends the apostles to baptize, but Jesus didn't send him to baptize. So Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize. However, the Great Commission says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Pleasing to all men. So Paul says, I please all men in all things, not my own prophet, but the prophet of many. So being a sort of chameleon, chameleon to win others, through whatever means necessary to the Jews, he's a Jew, to the Gentiles, he's a Gentile. However, woe to you when all men speak well of you.
Paul later contradicts himself in Galatians 1.10. Jesus says only the merciful receive mercy, but Paul says only those God chooses arbitrarily will have mercy, such as I will have mercy upon whom I have mercy and compassion upon whom I have compassion. So it depends not on man's will or exertion, but depends on God's mercy. However, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Paul says salvation does not depend upon exertion, but Jesus says it does. So again, quoting the same verse here, it depends not on man's will or exertion, but upon Jesus' mercy. However, here, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so if someone is an evildoer, rather than doing the will of Father in heaven, it is the deeds that make the difference, regardless of whether or not someone calls him Lord, Lord. Both the evildoers and the righteous are calling him Lord, Lord. It's the behavior that separates them on Judgment Day. Jesus says the law cannot justify a blasphemer, but Paul says it can. In Exodus 20, we know that the blasphemer will not be held guiltless. Paul, however, in 1 Timothy 13, has an example of a blasphemer who did receive mercy. That is to say, God apparently overlooked the offense. Jesus four-time teaches that grace is by exceeding the lukewarm works that sinners do. So Yeshua talks about those who do good to those who love you, do good to those who can repay you, to lend to them. But we must go higher to that and do good to those who do evil to us. We must lend without expecting in return, in hopes of helping others. Jesus resurrected and ascended into heaven in the flesh, but Paul says it cannot happen. So, Paul says that we, in our resurrected bodies, we're going to receive a new resurrected body. Flesh cannot inherit eternal life. However, we know when Jesus was resurrected, he had just appeared to the disciples, showing them the flesh, the, the scars, the, where the nails had been in his hands. So, he ascended into heaven as flesh, but flesh cannot inherit eternal life. Per Paul. Paul quotes the same Deuteronomy passage as Jesus quotes, but derives the opposite conclusion. So this is a passage, a worker is worthy of his wage. So Matthew 10.10, 10, Jesus is telling the apostles that they may not ask for money from whom they preach or teach. They are going to receive, yes, everything that they need, but they're not preaching for the sake of earning the wages. Paul, however, is saying that a worker is worthy of his mate. wage means that the, the preachers, the teachers, the apostles deserve the wage. So Paul's contradictions of Yahweh in the original testament. I will not justify the ungodly. He that justifies the ungodly is an abomination to Yahweh. But Paul says... He that believes on him justifies the ungodly, and his faith is counted as righteousness. Paul delivers a slave back to his master. Paul sent the slave back to his owner. This is forbidden in Deuteronomy 23, 15 through 16. Thou shalt not deliver to his master the servant which is escaped. Jesus Paul says Jesus is an image of God in violation of the first commandment. This also goes into a bit of, I believe Gnosticism is the word, that Jesus was just in the image of God or in the image of corruptible man. However, is Jesus actually in human flesh? And did he not return to heaven in human flesh when he was taken up into the clouds was his flesh still corruptible corrupted Paul says the worlds of the rulers of this world are God's agents in violation of holy scripture 
covered this one already. Paul's contradictions of himself. That's a fun one. I'm not going to go into that. Circumcision is a big issue. At one time he says if you're circumcised, you're cut off. If you're not circumcised, you're, you can be circumcised in the heart, which is the only circumcision that matters, he says. Later Paul says, well, maybe you can be circumcised, maybe not. He goes back and forth. He's a flip-flopper on all these situations. Paul had his companion, Timothy, circumcised, whereas Paul said, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be no advantage to you. So, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision. This is John 7, 22, not because it is of Moses, but it is of the fathers. And ye on Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I have made every whit whole on the Sabbath? So the circumcision commandment shall not be broken even if it happens to be that the eighth day circumcision is to take place on a Sabbath. So Yeshua is quite clear about this, and this goes back to the everlasting covenant between Yah and Abraham in Genesis 17. Paul's a little bit all over the place, so these are some of the main contradictions between Paul and Jesus. Not at all exhaustive, but a good starting point. <laughs>